Hungria, conquered and in chains, has done more for freedom and justice than any people for 20 years. But for this lesson to get through and convince those in the West who shut their eyes and ears, it was necessary and it can be no comfort to us for the people of Hungary to shed so much blood which is already drying in our memories. Albert Camus This was the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 and this is the good, the bad and the pure evil. So the autumn and winter of 1956, a popular mass movement began to rise up against the ruling communist dictatorship in Hungary and looked for a multi-party democracy and to have the country out of its military ties with the Soviet Union. Pretty reasonable. At first, it looked like the movement would be successful. Support increased and the occupying Soviet troops looked to be withdrawing. But by year's end, the revolution was suppressed by the Soviet military interventions. The leaders arrested and a new Hungarian communist government, loyal to the Soviet Union, had taken over. Although it would fail, the Hungarian revolution really did have an impact, marking a turning point in Europe's history. It was the first and some say only attempt at the re revolutionary overthrow of a ruling communist party and the whole system of political and economic institutions that happened before it. During World War II, the Kingdom of Hungary was a member of the Axis powers who had alliances with Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy and the Kingdom of Romania and Bulgaria. 1941, the Hungarian military took part in the invasion of Yugoslavia and in Operation Barbarossa, which was an invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany and other Axis allies. The event peeved the USSR a bit to say the least, and come 1944, the Red Army was marching their way to the Kingdom of Hungary after pushing back the Royal Hungarian Army an army from other Axis powers. Fear the Red Army would take over, Hungary looked for help from the Allies. The Nazis launched Operation Margrat, or the occupation of Hungary, and they created the Nazi government of national units in Hungary. But in late 1944, the Red Army defeated the German and Hungarian Nazis. February 10, 1947, a Paris peace treaty would confirm the defeat and stipulated the USSR now had the right to a military occupation in Hungary. The end of World War II, Hungary was in what was called the geopolitical sphere of influence of the USSR. Hungary became a multi-party democracy and in 1945, a coalition government made up of independent smallholders, agrarian workers and the Civic Party, headed by Prime Minister Tilly. But on behalf of the USSR, the Hungarian Communist Party continued to use what was called salami tactics, which is a divide and conquer process of threats and alliances to overcome oppositions. So this tactic was used to twist minor political concessions, which diminished the p political authority. Even though the Communist Party only made up 17% of the votes in 1945 elections. After the elections in 1945, control of the State Protection Authority, the AVH, or Secret Police of the People's Republic of Hungary, moved from the Independent Smallholders Party to the Hungarian Communist Party. This secret police repressed non-communist political opponents with intimidation, false accusations, jail and torture. The multi-party would only last four years ending when the Hungarian Social Democratic Party merged with the Communist Party, becoming the Hungarian Working People's Party. Their candidates stood unopposed in the parliamentary elections of 1949. Then in the August, the Hungarian People's Republic was proclaimed and established as a socialist state. 
They then had the COMECON or ComCon Treaty with the USSR, which allowed troops of the Red Army to station in Hungary. From the USSR's economic model, the Hungarian Working People's Party created the Socialist Economic of Hungary with the nationalization of the means of production and of the natural resources of the country. At first, the Hungarian People's Republic was a socialist state and was headed by communist government of the Matthias Rakowski, who was a Stalinist. To keep compliance of a Stalinist government, Rakowski used the secret police AVH to purge 7,000 politically incorrect Titoists or Trotskys from the Communist Party of Hungary for being, quote, Western agents, end quote, who took part in the Spanish Civil War which came between Stalin and his plans for world communism. In 1949, Rakowski's government tried and convicted Cardinal Mendiziti for treason against Hungary. According to them, he collaborated with Nazi Germany in the Holocaust in Hungary. 1950-1952, the secret police forced over 26,000 non-communist Hungarians out, taking their homes and giving them to members in the Communist Party and therefore eliminating the political threats posed by the nationalists and anti-communists. They were imprisoned in concentration camps, deported to the USSR or killed. Victims included the communist politician Rashk, who was the Minister of the Interior and started the secret police AVH. Rakowski's government politicized the education system, making the study of Russia language and communist politics mandatory at school and university. Religious schools were nationalized and church leaders replaced with communist officials. 1950s Rakowski's government's socialist econo economics increased, but the standard of living went downhill. The poor economy was floored due to mismanagement of resources, causing shortages of supplies resulting in rations of bread, sugar, flour and meat. Data showed the disposable income of the Hungarian workers in 1952 was two-thirds of that in 1938. Payments went to the Red Army occupation, war reparation to the USSR, Czechoslovakia Socialist Republic and to the Socialist Federal Republic of the Yugoslavia. These angered the Hungarian people and the cumulative efforts of economic austerity fueled anti-Soviet political discontent as the payment of foreign debt took the main importance over the material needs of the people. March 5, 1953, Stalin has died. This allowed the Communist Party of the Soviet Union to start de-Stalinization of the USSR, which allowed most European Communist parties and Communist parties of Warsaw Pact to develop a reformist wing within the structures of the philosophy of Marxism and orders from Moscow. Imre Nagy now became Prime Minister of the Hungarian People's Republic. Even though Rakowski wasn't Prime Minister, he remained politically in power as the General Secretary of the Hungarian Communist Party, undermining many of Nagy government reforms. By April 1955, Rakowski did such a good job making Nagy look weak that the USSR deposed Nagy as head of state. April 14th, he was stripped of his offices and functions, and by April 18th, he was fired as Prime Minister. February 1956, the first secretary, Nikita Khrushchev, began the de-Stalinization of the USSR. The de-Stalinization of Hungary had Rakowski removed as General Secretary in Hungary and replaced by Erno Guru in July 1956. Before that, on May 14th, back in 1955, with the Treaty of Friendship, Co Cooperation and Mutual Assistance, the USSR started the Warsaw Pact with seven Eastern Bloc countries, including Hungary.
The next day, the, Austri the Austrian State Treaty was created, which had, the Austri which had Austria declare a neutral country in a Cold War between the US and the USSR. With this, it allowed Nagy to consider Hungary's neutrality. So back to June 1956, the Polish army violently hit the workers' uprising at Ponzna against the economic policies of the Polish People's Republic. October, the Polish government appointed Wazel Gomolka as first secretary of the Polish United Workers' Party to deal with the USSR. By the 19th of that month, he had successfully achieved greater trade agreements and less Red Army in Poland. This had the Hungarians demand the same from the USSR, which contributed to the Hungarians' greatly idealistic politics in October. So October 13th, a group of about 12 students met to play cards and snubbed the Communist Student Union by re-establishing the MEFES. C, so Mephisi, a democratic union which was banned by Rakowski, Rakowski's government. Mephisi students gave out handwritten notes in the classes to let the staff and students know about a meeting on October 16, 1956. A law professor chaired the committee and they published a 20 demand manifesto. Ten demands were about the Mephisi and 10 about anti-Soviet demands. On October 22nd, Budapest University, one of the 12 law students announced that Mephisi, the student union, was back and active again. October 23rd, 1956, that afternoon, about 20,000 protesters met at General Josef's Bem statue. To this huge crowd, the president of the Writers' Union, Peter Verz, read a manifesto demanding the independence of Hungary from all foreign powers. It also demanded a democratic socialist party political system, uh, membership to the UN and all freedom and rights to its citizens. Once Verzi finished, the crowd began chanting the Hungarian patriotic poem, National Song a poem that Rakowski's government had banned in Hungary from public performances. The crowd would chant repeatedly, quote, This we swear, this we swear, that we will no longer be slaves, end quote. At 8pm, the first secretary, Guru, did a broadcast condemning these demands. Angered with Gero's rejection, some protesters went and demolished the stallion monument in Budapest, which had been erected of a, raz of a raised church in 1951. By 9.30 p.m., nationalist and anti-communist protesters destroyed a statue of Stalin. Also at 8 p.m., protesters gathered outside the Maiar radio building, guarded by the secret police A. B.H. Violence erupted when the protesters heard rumours of the arrest and detainment of students who went into the radio station to try broadcast their demands to the entire country. Things got worse when rumours of killing came. In response, the A.V.H. threw tear gas grenades from the windows and fired upon the protesters. A.V.H. got weapons to them by smuggling them in ambulance to the radio station. The Hungarian army sent soldiers but some joined the anti-government protesters. Protesters set police cars on fire and destroyed symbols of Russian communism in Hungary. That night, Gero called for the USSR military's help. At 2 a.m. October 24th, Soviet Defense Minister Skufkov ordered the Red Army to occupy Budapest, the capital of a Warsaw Pact country. By midday, the Red Army tanks were outside the Parliament building. Red Army soldiers held bridges and crossroads while Hungarian revolutionaries barricaded streets to defend the city against the Red Army. Imer Nagy would become Prime Minister that day, taking over from Andras Hegedus. 
In a broadcast, Nagy asked for a ceasefire between the Red Army and Hungarian revolutionaries and agreed to postpone political reforms that came from 1953. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. Urban and rural Hungarians armed themselves and continued to fight against the Red Army. At the communist newspaper offices, the AVH fired at unarmed protesters. Anti-communists then attacked and drove out the AVH. October 25th, anti-communists and nationalist revolutionaries gathered at the Hungarian parliament building and presented their demands to the government. From the rooftops, AVH fired into the protesters. In the confusion, some of the Red Army believed they were the targets and returned to fire. Protesters were also armed with donated weapons and also fired up at the AVH. The Hungarian army in Budapest and the countryside remained uninvolved. Order was restored from the 24th to 29th of October after the Hungarian army fought 71 fire fights with nationalists and anti-communist revolutionaries in 50 communities. As the revolutionaries fought with small arms and Molotov cocktails in the streets, the Revolutionary Workers' Council got government power and called general strikes to stop society functioning. Removing the influence and control of the USSR, the revolutionaries destroyed the symbols of communism, like the Red Star and the Red Army monuments, and burned literature of communist nature. The Hungarian Army Armoured Division was in Budapest and led the Hungarian Revolution against the USSR control and negotiated ceasefire agreements. The Hungarian Revolution would take many communist prisoners, placing them on a list as executed or enemy of the people. Cespel, 21st district in Budapest, 250 communists defended the iron and steel works. October 27, the Hungarian army got ordered back in Cesfel. Two days later, the revolutionaries took it back after the army withdrew. Anyal fold the 13th district in Budapest. Communists and 350 armed workers, along with 380 communist soldiers, defended the Lang factory. The town Starvas had armed guards defending the Hungarian Communist Party and the government. The revolutionaries successfully attacked parliament, collapsing the communist government. Erno Gero and Andras Hedgitsis fled to the USSR. Nagy became prime minister and Janos Kadar the first secretary. Nagy government freed political prisoner General Kerlali to restore order with a National Guard with police, soldiers and revolutionaries loyal to Hungary. On October 30th, Kerlali's National Guard attacked the building of the Central Committee of the Hungarian Communist Party and killed every pro-Soviet officer in the Hungarian Communist Party in AVH and who were pro-Soviet Hungarian soldiers that they came across. Most of the Red Army troops withdrew from Budapest to the Hungarian countryside. Fighting stopped from October 28 until November 4, with many Hungarians thinking the Soviets were withdrawing. Post-revolution communist sources would report that 213 Hungarian working party members were being lynched or executed in this period. Nagy, the Prime Minister, was shocked at the speed of which the revolution extended from streets to all over and at the collapse of the old Gero Hedges communist government. With his political credibility among Hungarians, the political actions of the Nagy government allowed the USSR to view the Hungarians' anti-Soviet protests as an uprising, not an anti-communist counter-revolution. On October 28, 1956, the Nagy government announced a ceasefire. They also announced terms to resolve the national crisis. 
Such terms were he'd consider the revolt as a national and democratic event, not an anti-communist counter-revolution. He'd consider political amnesty to the revolutionaries. He'd consider negotiations with them. And he considered the disbandment of the AVH. And he'd finally considered to create a National Guard and arrange immediate withdrawal of the Red Army. November 1st, Nagy's government formally announced Hungary's withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact and that the Hungar Hungary was a politically non-aligned country. About 8,000 political prisoners were released. The once banned parties like independent smallholders joined the coalition. In over 1,100 communities in Hungary, there were 350 cases of revolutionary councils dismissed local administration. 310 cases of revolutionary councils sacked bosses. 210 cases of local burned communist records. 680 communities had anti-communist and nationalist damage or destroyed USSR symbols and statues. 390 communities damaged Soviet war memorabilia. 120 communities burned books of Marx, Lenin and Stalin. By October 30th, councils were officially sanctioned by the Hungarian Working People's Party and the Nagy government called for their support. Workers' councils was created at industrial plants and mines and many unpopular regulations were eliminated. The Workers' Council aim was to manage the enterprise and protect workers' interests and create a socialist economy free of rigid party control. Control wasn't always bloodless. In Depression or Sofrenon and others, demonstrators were fired on by the AVH, with many being killed. The councils held a combined conference in Budapest that ended the nationwide labour strike, resuming work on November 5th. Councils of higher status sent delegates to Parliament giving assurance to Nagy of their support. October 24, 1956, the Politburo of the USSR had a chat about how to fix the political revolts happening in Warsaw Pact countries like the Polish October and the Hungarian Revolt. CPSU voted for a military intervention, which was opposed by Khrushchev, who wanted a political revolution. Budapest and Soviet delegation was telling Moscow the Hungarian political situation wasn't as confrontational as was being reported. Khrushchev believed Guru's 23rd October request for Soviet intervention and it be believed it showed Hungarian Communist Party still held confidence of the people because the Hungarians were protesting unresolved socio-economic problems and not ideology. While this was going on, the West, while this was going on in the West, the Seuss crisis was happening, meaning no political possibility of a West military intervention to Hungary. October 28, Khrushchev said Soviet military intervention would be mistaken as imitations of Anglo-French intervention to Egypt. Russia, October 30th, the presidium, the presidium of CPSU decided not to dispose the new Hungarian government. Over in Hungary on the same day, rumours were mounting about the secret police and AVH shooting anti-communist demonstrators. So armed protesters attacked the AVH detachment regarding the HQ of the Hungarian Working People's Party in Budapest. Anti-communists killed over 20 AVH officers. Within hours, scenes were broadcasted in the USSR and the CPSU made propaganda of the images of the communist victims of the Hungarian revolt. Leaders of the Hungarian Revolution condemned the attack, calling for protesters to cease and desist. October 30th was a very busy day. Budapest Anastas 
Mikoyan and Mikhail Suslov had talks with Prime Minister Nike, who said the Hungarian geopolitical neutrality was a long-term political objective, one which he wanted to discuss with the Presidium of the CPSU. Khrushchev would consider geopolitical options for the USSR resolution to the Hungarian anti-communist revolution, revolution. But with Nagy's declaration of neutrality, had Khrushchev dispatched the Red Army into Hungary. The USSR sent diplomatic delegations to other communist governments in the East, Europe and to China in effort to avoid misunderstandings that could provoke regional conflicts and broadcast propaganda explaining their second Soviet intervention to Hungary. Soviet diplomats would hide their intentions by engaging the Nike government with talks about withdrawing the Red Army from Hungary. Chinese communist revolutionary Mao Zedong had, Khrus has, had Khrushchev's ear and influenced his decision to repress the Hungarian uprising. Liu Shaqi, deputy chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, pressed Khrushchev to militarily repress the Hungarian revolution. Now the Sino-Soviet relations weren't the best, but the opinion of Mao carried a lot of weight with those in the presidium of the CPSU. At first, Mao opposed the second intervention, which was relayed to Khrushchev on October 30th, before the presidium met and decided against a Hungarian intervention. Later though, Mao changed his thinking and supported the intervention. November 1st to 3rd, Khrushchev told the USSR's Warsaw Pact allies of his decision to repress. Khrushchev met Polish communist Gomulka in Belarus and he then spoke with the Romanian, Czechoslovakian and Bulgarian leaders in Romania. Finally, he went to Yugoslavia and spoke to Josip Bras or Tito and he persuaded Khrushchev to install Janos Kadar as the leader of Hungary instead of Ferenc Munich. Events in Hungary were met with a very spontaneous reaction in Poland. Poland would display Hungarian flags in many towns and villages. After the Soviet invasion, the help given to the, by the Polish to Hungarian took a huge scale. Citizen organizations were set up throughout Poland to distribute aid to the Hungarians. By November 12th, over 11,000 blood donors registered throughout Poland. Polish Red Cross stats showed just by air. 44 tons of meds, bloods and medical supplies were delivered to Hungary. Help by road and rail were much higher, with Poland estimating a value of $2 million. October 24, 1956, the US would come into play. The US Secretary of State, Dulles, advised the UN Secretary Security Council convened to discuss the USSR's invasion and occupation of Hungary without decisive result. Dulles would t tell the USSR that the states like Hungary and Poland weren't seen as potential military allies. November 4th, the USSR vetoed the Security Council's resolution and instead passed the UN Security Council's Resolution 120, which charged the General Assembly which demanded withdrawal of the Red Army from Hungary. 50 votes were for withdrawal, 8 were against and 15 abstentions. But the final say came down to the communist Kadar, who rejected the presence of UN observers in the Hungarian People's Republic. Once the USSR defeated the Hungarian Revolution, Criticism came from the revolutionists to the CIA for having white lied the Hungarians into thinking the West, like NATO and US, would get rid of the USSR from the, from the Hungarian People's Republic. Enough was enough for the Soviets. It was time to shut it down. 
So November 1, 1956, Nagy got word Soviet forces were in Hungary, in the east coming to Budapest. Nagy looked for assurances, which turned out to be lies, but he looked for it from the Soviet ambassador Andrew Puff, that the Soviet Union would not invade. Cabinet with Qadar came to an agreement and Hungary neutrality was declared. They also withdrew from the Warsaw Pact and looked for assistance from diplomatic corps in Budapest and the UN Secretary General to defend the neutrality. Andrew Pov was asked to tell his government that the negotiations should start on getting Soviet forces out immediately. November 3rd, Hungarian delegation was invited to negotiations on Soviet withdrawal. At midnight, General Surov, Chief of the Soviet Chief of the Soviet Security Police or KGB, he ordered the Hungarian delegation to be arrested and then the next day had the Soviet army attack Budapest again. The second Soviet intervention called Operation Whirlwind was launched. The five Soviet divisions in Hungary by October 23rd were now reinforced and soon the strength increased to 17 divisions. By 9.30 on the night of November 3rd, the Soviet army now circled Budapest. At 3 a.m. November 4th, Soviet tanks broke into Budapest. Before a single shot was fired, the Soviets had the city split in two. They had control of all bridge heads and were shielded by the Danube River. Armoured units got into Buda at 4.30 a.m. and they fired the first shots at the army barracks on Budarossi Road. Soon the sound of tank fire was heard in all districts of Budapest. Operation Whirlwind had airstrikes, artillery and tank infantry. November 4 to November 9th, the Hungarian army scrambled with an all over the place resistance. The Hungarian fighters really tried. There were 10 to 15,000 resistance fights fighting in Budapest. Some senior officers were openly pro-Soviet, but the rank and file soldier were hugely loyal to the revolution and either fought or deserted. UN records showed no recorded incidents of Hungarian army units fighting for the Soviets. November 4th at 5.20 a.m. Nagy broadcast a final call to the nation and the world. He announced Soviet forces were attacking Budapest and that the government remained at his post. The radio station would stop broadcasting at 8 a.m. An emergency cabinet meeting happened, but only three ministers showed up. Soviet troops arrived at the building and an evacuation was negotiated. November 4 to 6 a.m., the town of Skolnok, Kadar proclaimed the Hungarian revolutionary worker peasant government. Later, he called for the true fighters of the cause to take up arms, but the Hungarian support didn't come. The UN will report the fighting as, quote, a well-equipped foreign crushing by an overwhelming force, a national movement, and eliminating the government, end quote. By 8 a.m., defense of the city vanished and the radio station was taken. Between 8 and 9 a.m., the parliamentary guard laid down arms. The parliament was captured and the ministers of Krakowski's government were freed. Soviet tanks crept along the roads, firing into buildings. Hungarian resistance was strongest in the industrial areas, which were heavy, heavily targeted with airstrikes by Soviets. Fighting lasted until November 11th, when finally insurgents succumbed. When the fighting ended, Hungarian casualties were 2,500 dead and 20,000 injured. Over 50% of the dead were workers, and over 50% were under the age of 30. Soviets claimed they had 700 deaths and 1,500 injured and 50 mash, uh, missing in action. The first Soviet report came a day after the first Western report. Nagy would be arrested outside the Yugoslavia embassy. An arrest that wasn't reported and also not reported was Nagy's appeals to the UN. 
Accounts also fail to explain why and how Nagy went from hero to traitor. The Soviet press would report Budapest as calm, but the Western press reported a revolutionary crisis. Soviets claimed Hungarians never wanted a revolution. In January 1957, representatives of the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, Romania and Hungary met to review internal developments in Hungary since the setup of Soviet-imposed government. Soviet, Chinese and Warsaw Pact governments urged Qadar to have interrogations and trials of ministers of Nike's government. White books were published documenting real incidents of violence against Communist Party and AVH members, as well as a confession of Nike supporters. The books were distributed globally, although they are not generally, generally supported by non-Soviet aligned historians. So the aftermath, thousands of Hungarians were arrested, 26,000 were brought before the courts, 22,000 were imprisoned, 13,000 interned and over 200 executed. About 200,000 fled as refugees. On and off resistance and strikes by worker councils remained until mid 1957, causing economic disruption. Come 1963, most political prisoners from the revolution was released. By November 8, 1956, most of Budapest was under Soviet control. Kadar would be Prime Minister of the Revolutionary Worker Peasants Government and General Secretary of the Hungarian Communist Party. Few Hungarians rejoined, uh, its leadership had been purged by Soviets. Before the uprising, members sat at 800,000, which dropped to 100,000 by December 1956. Slowly but surely, Qadar increased his control. After 1956, the Soviet Union massively purged the Hungarian army. In May 1957, Soviet troops increased in Hungary and with a treaty, Hungary accepted Soviet presence permanently. The Red Cross and Austrian army set up refugee camps. Nagy would take refuge in the embassy of Yugoslavia. He would be assured by Soviets and Qadar a safe passage out, but was arrested November 22nd and was taken to Romania. Nagy was executed after trials in June 1958. Nicholas Krasoso, a uh, left leader of the uprising, gave an interview to Peter Gowan. He summed up the meeting of the uprising and he spoke of Stalin and a speech he gave in 1952. Saying, quote, he said there were two banners that the progressive bourgeois, bourgeois had thrown away and which the working class should pick up the banners of the democracy and national independence. Certainly nobody could doubt that in 1956, the Hungarian workers raised these banners high." End quote. Public discussion of the revolution was a big no-no in Hungary for over 30 years. From the 80s, the revolution was a subject of intense study and debate. In 1989, at the inauguration of the Third Hungarian Republic, the 23rd of October was declared a national holiday. Uh, June 16, 1989, Nagy's body was reburied with full honours. December 1991, the Soviet Union officially apologised for their actions in 1956. And that is the story of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Like and subscribe to my YouTube and podcast and join me next time for the 1976 Tang Shan earthquake happening July 28, 1976 at 3.42 a.m. It collapsed 85% of the buildings in Tang Shan. All services failed and most highway and railway bridges collapsed. With deaths, injured, missing, the death toll was huge. It is the deadliest earthquake in China and it is among the top disasters in China. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil.